Okay, I think we should go ahead and we can kick it off. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ken Oliver. Welcome to the LSPC All of Us or None webinar on the CARES Act. I'm here with our staff attorney, Christine Starkey. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. We are glad all of you could join us today. Today, we're going to be talking about how to receive your money and maximize your benefits from the COVID-19 stimulus package. Uh, we'll be sharing some important information. Uh, if you haven't already gotten your stimulus check on how to do that, how to maximize your unemployment benefits and all things money uh, dealing with the federal COVID-19 stimulus package. Uh, so with, with, with that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ken Oliver. I'm the policy manager here at LSPC and all of us are none. And I'm here with our staff attorney, Christine Starkey. Uh, Christine, can you tell us just briefly, what is the CARES Act or the Stimulus Act that everybody's been talking about? Okay, so the Corona, it's, the CARES Act stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And so once the pandemic hit, um, Congress actually enacted three different um, pieces of, of legislation. And this is the third. Um, so the first one just dealt with public health. The second one was called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And this third one is called the CARES Act. The CARES Act is the one that gives us the cash payment and small business loans. Okay, great. I have a, I have a question about the CARES Act and, and I'm sure that a lot of our members and people across the state wanna know, are formerly incarcerated persons eligible to receive the benefits that are stipulated in the CARES Act? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yes. Um, in terms of individuals and the cash payment, the formerly incarcerated folks are, are definitely eligible. Um, in terms of small business loans, they are eligible with some restrictions. There's a lot of information out there that says that they're not eligible at all, and that's a little bit overstated. Um, the Small Business Administration um, oversees these loans. Normally, they prohibit folks who are formerly incarcerated from getting the loans. Under the CARES Act, there are some restrictions, um, but if you own less than 20% 20 20 of a small business, then you can be eligible. Can you, can you talk to us just a little bit about what type of aid is available for people in our community so they have a better understanding of what they can apply for and what they may uh, have coming? Sure. So... Um, in terms of what they can get as individuals, it's the same as, as everyone else. And so I can go through that um, and it might help at this point to share my screen a little bit um, so you can just see the list of what's available. We'd appreciate that. Okay, so under the CARES Act, these are the things that are available. You can get the cash payment, which is the stimulus check. Um, you get increased unemployment benefits. You get increased paid leave. Technically, that's under the Family First Act, but I'm going to include it because people probably have questions about it. Um, folks in federal prisons get free calls and free video calls. Um, you have an extension of time to file your tax returns. And you get student loan, health benefits. You can withdraw money from your retirement account early without penalty if you need it. Um, and you also get some increased tax benefits for next year. I have a question, Christine. I'm sure that everybody's anxious to, to find out because I'm anxious to find out how much money can I get? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's a good question. Um, so here. <laughs> um, Okay, if you earn $75,000 or less, you can get up to $1,200 a year. If you earn between $75,000 and $99,000, you get a little bit less. And if you earn over $99,000, you wouldn't qualify for anything. Right. Um, in order to get that, um, you have to have a Social Security number, and you either have to have filed your taxes last year or this year. If you, if you did file them last year, this year, or you're getting social security benefits, you don't have to do anything. The money will come to you automatically based on the most recent income information available. So just, and, you know, I want to ask one question, Christine, excuse me for interrupting. In, a, in order for me to get a stimulus check for $1,200 if I'm single or $2,400 if I'm married, I have to have had filed a tax return in either 2018 or 2019. Is it, am I hearing that correctly? Actually, you have to have filed it either this year, 2020, or the tax year, 2019. 
or last year, which would have been for the tax year 2018. I appreciate that. So either you filed it this year or last year, or you're already getting social security benefits. So if, if either of those things are, are, you've already done that, then you will automatically get it. If you haven't filed tax returns and you're not getting social security benefits, you can go to this um, website that's, that's posted on here, irs.gov slash coronavirus slash economic dash impact dash payment and register. Um, you can, you can do a couple of things at that website. You can register if you haven't filed taxes and don't get social security benefits and you will get the payment. Um, if you want direct deposit, you can go on there and enter your direct deposit so you're not waiting for a check in the mail. And you can do that even if you've already filed taxes in the past. If you've moved since you last filed taxes, you can update your mailing address and you can, you're supposed to be able to check the status of your payment, but at the moment, people aren't getting much status information, but it's supposed to it's supposed to do that at some point. Okay, that's helpful. So and I, then if, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. And then if you're if you're interested in if you make more than seventy five thousand but less than ninety nine thousand, um, you can go online and there's a number of calculators available where you could just type in you know how much will I get under the CARES Act. And um, I have one posted here from the Washington Post, but there's a number of others and you can, you can figure out how much you'll get. That's, that's very insightful, helpful information. I, I had a question about that I get often from, from people that we hear from behind the wall, the brothers and sisters that are behind the wall. Uh, if you're currently incarcerated, can you file for a stimulus check if you plan to get out soon before the stimulus checks arrive? Or what is the exact state of affairs in reference to a person being incarcerated and filing for a stimulus check. Okay, so if you're um, if you're currently incarcerated, it's unfortunately it's not clear. Um, there, there, the CARES Act doesn't specifically answer that, and there's a number of different views online. Um, the prevailing view seems to be that if you file taxes this year or last year, you should automatically be getting it because you should be in queue for the IRS to pay you. Um, if you haven't filed taxes and you want to go online and try to register, it seems like you could try to at least register. In 2009, when the stimulus checks came out, they were about $250 back then. Um, some, some of them did go to uh, folks inside, but that was considered a mistake and they were supposed to return them. But the CARES Act doesn't specifically address folks inside. Um, in terms of if you've been released soon, it's different. If you're going to get out soon um, or you are out now, you can register. You don't have to have any employment history. You, you can register at that website above. And as long as you register by July 15th, you should get the check. So as long as a person is able to get out of prison by the 15th of July, they should, still should be able to register. And in fact, if they have access, they can register now, knowing that they'll be out by July 15th, which is the deadline, and then they can start. Uh, receiving their stimulus check money. Am I hearing that? Exactly. Correctly? Yes. That's good. I appreciate that. I, I, on that same note, I want to pivot and talk about the homelessness people in California. Those are our brothers and sisters that are homeless. There's a homeless homelessness epidemic in California. For those of you who don't know, can you talk a little bit about if a person has been homeless, they haven't been able to file a tax return, or they don't have an address for a tax return to go or in a bank account? Are those people eligible, and how would they go about making themselves eligible to receive this very much needed money? You can go online to the same web address and register. They would need a social security number and either a bank number where they can have it direct deposited or a mailing address. As long as they have that, they can also get it. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, another question that I'm getting, are, are these payments taxable or do they have to be paid back? I've heard uh, different rumors online from Instagram and Facebook that people are saying that if you get this check, it's really just an advance against future tax returns. Uh, is that true or is that just a rumor? And will people have to pay taxes on this money? They, you do not have to pay taxes on it. It's considered a tax credit um, and it, it doesn't have to be paid back. Okay, that's good. Will college students be able to get stimulus checks? Yeah, this is a really good question because it also goes to the benefits for children. Um, if you have a dependent minor who is under 17, you should get, and if your income falls into a certain category, um, say under 75,000, you will get 
$500 per child. Um, but it's under 17. Um, so 17 and older, if you claim them as a dependent and they're, old, they're 17 or older, you, you won't get the $500. And if you claim them as a dependent, they won't be able to um, register for their own payment. If they're 17 or older and they're not claimed as a dependent on anyone's tax return, they can register and also get this payment. Mm, okay, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that's come up too is, is people that are, have been laid off or unemployed. I mean, uh, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our community. Uh, a lot of people who have been in service jobs or labor jobs have been laid off uh, because of the stay at home orders. Uh, if I'm already receiving or if a person is already receiving unemployment benefits, are they eligible then to receive the money or is that counted as extra money or what does that look like? Um, if, you're, if you're unemployed or if your hours were cut, if you're receiving unemployment benefits, you're still eligible for that. It, it doesn't reduce how much you can get under, under the stimulus. Right, so it doesn't affect my unemployment benefits at all? Correct. Okay, that's good. What about if I'm, uh, for our immigrant community out there, uh, California has a lot of immigrants. Uh, we represent immigrants in some of the lobbying and legislation that we do. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about our immigrant community, those people that don't necessarily have uh, the proper uh, identification or tax identification in reference to social security cards. Uh, if they're not citizens, can they apply for stimulus checks? Yes, good question. Um, there's, there's two different categories. So if you have a social security number and you're living and working in the US, then you can definitely get the stimulus check. Um, if you're on a work visa or if you have a green card, you qualify for the stimulus check. And if you live in California, and this is only California, if you live in California and you're undocumented, you can apply for uh, $500 in unemployment um, in May. It, it's the, we're the only state to be doing that, and um, the application process will start in May. So, so just so everybody hears that, if you're not documented, you can still receive benefits, and then there's a $500 benefit that you can apply for if you're undocumented. Yeah, it's not that much, but it's it's more than nothing. So it's five hundred. It's a $500 one-time payment per person with a maximum of a $1,000 per household. Okay. Thank you for that, Christine. Uh, what happens if I owe back taxes? What happens if I owe the government money? I have some type of fine or fee levied against me. How will that affect me receiving my $1,200? If you have back taxes, it will not, um, they will not garnish your check. You will still get the $1,200 or however much you're entitled to. That's what's up. So, now, so, so, matter, so no matter how much money I haven't paid before, I'm still eligible to get my $1,200 now. Yes. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome. What about people who owe child support? Uh, Unfortunately for child support, if you owe child support, that will be garnished from the check. Mm. So I can't get around uh, that. They'll take the money if, I, if a person owes uh, child support. Yes. Okay, that's, that's, that's good information. Uh, I don't know, Mark, are there any more questions that we've had from the audience in reference to uh, how to receive the cash payments? I see we have a, a couple of people that are asking questions. Uh, one of the questions that I see we're getting from Jose is if you declared a loss on your taxes in 2018, can you still get your $1,200 in the stimulus money? It, so if you declared a loss last year, can you get a stimulus check? 2018. 2018. And by that, you mean like a loss with a small business? No, uh, declared a loss on his taxes. He doesn't say whether it's a small business, but I'm going to assume. Yeah, small business. He said yes, small business. So whatever um, profits or losses you have with a small business, it shouldn't have any impact on this individual payment. The twelve hundred dollars is 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 just for an individual, and it doesn't have anything to do with necessarily with your small business, unless um, the small business was the basis for your income and it was more than ninety nine thousand dollars, then you wouldn't get anything. Okay. Did, did that make sense to you? Let me try that again. <laughs> All right. No, I think he got it. He can. He can. Okay. Tap back in if you didn't catch the question. Uh, another question that we had from Jamie Martinez is, is if you are still working, but your partner has been laid off, are you able to receive the money? Yeah, everybody gets the money. Whether you're working, whether you're not working, if you're in the U.S., you have a Social Security number, you, you should get the money. And then it, how much you get just depends on the most recent income reports that you have. 
Can you talk a little bit more about the restrictions to people with records being eligible for small business loans uh, and specifically what type of restrictions exist that the SBA has put out? I know there's been some talk recently about what the SBA is doing and some of the restrictions they put on some of us who have conviction histories. Can you speak to that a little bit, Christine? Yes, actually, what, I'm going to get to the end, and I have a whole, I have a slide on that one, and we'll go through that in detail. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for the questions. If you want to go into uh, your presentation or your slide on some of the SBA stuff or some of the other things that you're here to represent for us today, this might be a good time to do it. Sure. Um, so the, the cash stimulus is a payment that you get whether you're working or you're not working. As long as you make 75 or less, you're going to get that. Between 75 and 99, you'll get a little bit less. But working or not working, everybody gets that. So now I'm just going to switch into unemployment benefits. So this is more specifically if you've been laid off or if your hours have been cut or even if you have your own business, your contract worker, and you're losing business because of the pandemic. And just, so we're, just so we're following you, we're transitioning from the cash get your cash money. Now we're going over to the benefits to talk a little bit about unemployment and, and how that may affect an individual or a family. Exactly. Exactly. So let me share my screen. Okay. Sorry, this is Mark. I just have one question on the family thing before, um, before you move on, uh, there was a question of why, why, do, why do people who owe child support not receive it while people who uh, have loans, student loans, and other, other forms of debt um, do get it? I don't know the reason. Um, and it's not that you don't get it, it'll, but it could be garnished. So um, the back child support would just be reduced from, from that payment. You still might have something coming to you. So it would be worth registering. And then if I can give it a little insight, just to chime in on Christine's point, uh, if you owe child support, you still will get a stimulus check. Let's make that clear. I think that in an effort to uh, advance the notion of supporting families who need these stimulus checks the most, I think that you know the government probably has taken the position that that money needs to go to support families and they generally are not gonna reward uh, individuals in their mind and this you know i'm getting inside of their head a little bit uh people who have not lived up to their financial obligations uh for families uh in this time of crisis so you know i think that's probably some of the perspective that uh the government is moving forward with that particular item and i hope that answers uh the person's question at least a little bit thank you ken i, th I think that's a good explanation so, okay so moving on to the unemployment benefits um, I think a lot of people are confused by the unemployment benefits because it's a mix of state and federal. Normally, unemployment benefits are just through your state. If you're unemployed, you register through your state, and there are a lot of rules. You have to keep looking for work. You have to have been um, either laid off. You can't have quit voluntarily. Um, you have to have a certain amount of work history. Um, and they've changed the rules for the pandemic, so it's, um, it's easier. Um, more people will qualify, um, they'll get benefits for a longer period of time, and they'll get more money. Part of that comes from the state, and part of that comes from the federal government. The, the portion for the federal government is called the PUA, or the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Ideally, what should happen is you should go to your state website um, whatever state you're in, apply. And once your application is accepted, you, ideally you should get both the state and the federal benefits together without having to worry about what source it's coming from. Um, but there's some exceptions to that. So um, what I have online here, it says apply by state. So if you're out of California, if you're not in California, it's um, dol.gov slash coronavirus slash unemployment dash insurance. That's the Department of Labor, and they have a list of every state. So you can scroll down, click on your state. It'll take you to where you need to apply for your state. Um, the benefits that everybody gets, or you're supposed to get the benefits that you would normally get in your state. Then you should get an extra $600 a week for four months, and that is through the end of July. In addition to that, however long your state pays you, you should get an extra 13 weeks. 
So in California, you get 26 weeks of paid unemployment and you up to 26 weeks. And here you could get up to 39 weeks. Also, more people can get paid. Um, the contract workers, gig workers, freelancers, independent contractors, if you're self-employed, if maybe you're re really recently released and you don't have enough work history, you can still qualify. You can still apply. So in California, a lot of states have been saying they have all these calls and people can't reach the, the unemployment department. In California, starting today, they've hired more than a thousand people to expand their call center and they're going to keep the call center open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to get through in California. The idea is that it will be a one-stop shop for state and federal benefits. But the problem is, is that if, say, you apply and you're denied for regular benefits, maybe say you are self-employed, um, you have, then you go to a different place to apply for the PUA. That's the federal portion, the $600 a week. Um, and that, they, I just found that today, um, and we'll, we'll send an email out with the website later, but it, um, this is the website on my screen, and we're going to send that out in an email. So if you're a contract worker, a freelancer, a gig worker, and you're not, um, maybe you were denied regular unemployment benefits, Go to this um, pandemic unemployment assistance link for the EDD, and um, and you can apply there. And we'll send that out in the email. I don't know if there's questions. Also, um, the uh, PUA is supposed to be paid within 24 to 48 hours, as opposed to the usual three-week waiting period. And the seven-day, and this is in California. And the seven-day waiting period for claims in California is waived. Your work search is waived. And um, if you're partially unemployed, uh, like your, um, your wages have been reduced or your hours are cut, usually there's a lot more paperwork, and that paperwork has been waived. Christine, does this apply to both citizens and residents or just citizens? Um, you, don't, uh, you don't have to be a U.S. citizen, but if you have a green card or a work visa and a Social Security number, this, will, this should apply to you. If you're undocumented, then in May, they're going to have, um, you can register for that one-time $500 payment. Thank you. Are there, are there questions out there? It looks like some questions were popping up on the screen. I don't know if there's some questions out there. Somebody asked, how can they receive the, looks like $10, but that may be a misprint, $10 emergency business fund loan for a nonprofit? Oh, okay. We're, we're getting to the business loans. That's also, we'll get down to the business loans. Okay, we'll get to that. So, okay. right. All right. So, um, this one I'm going to go through quickly because it's not really part of the CARES Act. It's part of the Family First Act um, that there are um, increased paid leave benefits. So, again, I've got the website here for the Department of Labor. You can get more information. Um, but you get two weeks you're sick from the coronavirus or you're ordered into quarantine, not the same quarantine we're all in, but specifically your doctors told you to, to quarantine yourself, um, you get two weeks paid at your regular rate. If um, you need to take time to care for a family member who's sick from COVID-19 or because your children's school or daycare has been canceled, then you can take two weeks at um, two-thirds your salary. Your employer, if they're under 500 employees and over 50, between 50 and 500 employees, they have to pay that. It doesn't matter how much vacation you have accrued um, and they can't force you to use your, um, your existing vacation time first. Um, once those two weeks have been used up, if your children um, still are out of school, if the childcare and school are still canceled due to the, the pandemic, you can take another 10 weeks paid again at two-thirds of your salary capped at two hundred dollars a day and we, we, we did have a one or two questions real quick if i could interject and i didn't mean to interrupt you forgive me for that um we had a person that asked again oh, this is back to the uh immigrant question if a person is undocumented but has a social security number are they able to qualify to receive the stimulus money um it, if they don't have a green card or a work visa, 
um, then if they, you know, if they were to go register on that website, it seems like that might be, um, I, I don't know, that seems like that would be a risk they, they may or may not want to take. And that would, that would apply even if they have a social security card? If you have a social security card, but you don't have a work visa or a green card, um, and you're undocumented and you're, um, you know. It may not be worth the risk to take. Exactly. Right. Okay, and then there was another question that somebody had. I guess there, and I, this is the first I'm hearing about this, that TurboTax had a glitch for people that actually filed their own taxes with TurboTax, and that some kind of way it was blocking them getting the stimulus money. So someone asked if we had any updates on how people could receive their stimulus check if they filed with TurboTax. Have you, are you familiar with this, Christine? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So you can go to that, the website that we have, that IRS portal, and put in your information, and I... I think one of the problems with TurboTax was they weren't um, getting automatic deposits. So you can still go to that IRS portal, enter your bank account information, and, um, and, uh, and update whatever information you need to get, to get the check. Okay. And then I had another question here about the Employment Development Department. Uh, if the Employment Development Department is telling someone that their unemployment benefits have expired, is there a way to get additional payments or extend the time a person can be unemployed or get unemployment. Benefit. Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, so, um, so on here, okay. So that's a great question. So on here, that the seven day, if they say that it's expired, go back and apply again, try to reopen the claim. Um, you're entitled to another 13 weeks and you're also entitled to um, the $600 a week for four months, right? So, so go back, try to get the $600 a week for four months, try to get your extra 13 weeks. And also, if you applied for unemployment, if you were, say, laid off before the pandemic happened, but um, it's from January 19th on, um, and they, they didn't pay you for that first week because they don't usually pay you for the first week, you can retroactively go back and get that first week of pay from January 19th. So you would go back to um, eddca.gov slash unemployment slash file underscore a slash underscore claim um, and, and register for those things. Uh, a person that asked about the TurboTax question wanted to know, uh, or they wanted to say that when they went to go get their payment and go to that website that we linked them to, that it says there's no information found. Uh, and do you have any suggestions on maybe an alternative link or where they could go to possibly get more information on how to claim their money if they filed with TurboTax? Um, yeah, so that IRS um, website should be um, here. And um, this, this IRS.gov slash coronavirus, um, that website should work now. Um, they may not be able to give you the information on the status of your check, but you should be able to log on, register, and put in your direct deposit information. Um, the status part is supposed to come soon, but it's for a lot of people it's not working yet, but you should be able to enter your direct deposit information. Okay. Were you going to talk a little bit about paid leave and other benefits under the CARES Act? Yes. So, um, uh, okay. So the, the, pay, the paid leave is not actually part of the CARES Act. It's part of the Family First Act. But um, so like I was saying, you will get um, two weeks paid leave if you're sick um, or if you have to take care of a, a sick family member or a child whose school is closed. Um, and then you get another 10 weeks to take care of, um, to stay home, take care of the child if the school or daycare is canceled. That's a two thirds of your usual pay. And then there are a lot, there's a lot of more information out there if you are still employed, but your hours are cut or your wages are cut or you need to take time off. And that's not really part of the CARES Act, but um, Katie Dixon from um, Legal Aid at Work has very graciously offered to share their manual, which is called um, The Worker's Guide, Your Rights During the Coronavirus. And that, that talks about a whole, a whole panoply of rights that you have if you're employed, but they're changing things around because of the um, pandemic. And so we're gonna include that in the email that we send out after this. 
And then, uh, Katie, I don't know if you're on the line, but um, you're welcome to say hi or ask any questions. That's very helpful. Yeah, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Hey, Katie. Hey, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. good. Thanks for being here. No, thank you so much for providing um, <clears throat> this super duper helpful webinar um, right now in this time. You know, this is a a, 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 a a panic time for a lot of people, and this is a really good, helpful information that you are offering. And so, yeah, my name is Katie. I go by KD. And I am in California, and I work for an organization called Legal Aid at Work. And what we do is focus on low-wage workers' rights, and we provide free services across seven different platforms. And we have really just been, um, re you know, right now our focus has definitely been more on the UI claims and the paid family leave and all the different vari variations of the Families First Act and the CARES Act. And so, yes, like Christine said, she has, she says she will include that stuff and the email, I guess, that she was sending around to you all, but it's called the Workers' Rights Guide. And please take a look at the Workers' Rights Guide. It is super duper insightful. It is really detailed and it really kind of go, it gives you like some questions. It'll, it'll, you know, put out a question. What if I can still work, but my child's school is closed? It'll go into all those details as far as what you should be looking forward to, what you should be applying to, whether it's, um, like she said, the UI benefits, is it PUA? Should I be, you know, so the Workers' Rights Guide is super duper helpful. It was put together by us over at Legal Aid at Work in partnership with a couple of other organizations. We also have it in the Spanish version as well. That way folks um, can get it sent around to people that primarily speak a Spanish of some sort. And I just really want to encourage you guys, you can also check out our website. Um, we and it, we, they provide a slew of information related to the coronavirus, and we are definitely proud to say that we are keeping this stuff as up to date and as accurate as we can. Um, like Christine said earlier, the information is coming fast, you know, they're changing fast. I think the last time they were talking, they're on like um, the Family First Part Three, I believe they're getting ready to come out with the third act, so the information is coming quick. And it takes a, you know, people are really dedicated to really diving into it, dissecting that information and getting it out to the community and primarily in partnership with LSPC and with Christine and Ken, we want to make sure our formerly incarcerated population has access to accurate, up-to-date information for us. Um, you know, we are hearing some of the rumors about folks can't get the SBA loans because of possible you know, criminal records or something like that. So we are definitely trying to make sure our formerly incarcerated population is well informed. We're trying to make sure we all have access to accurate information. And I just want to um, encourage you guys to continue to check in with LSPC going on the website and also with Legal Aid at Work. And thank you guys so much, Christine. And if I didn't send you the Spanish version, let me know so I can get that to you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That would be, I think we don't have that. That would be great, Katie. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that, Katie. We appreciate you. Thank you. No, thank you too, Ken. I appreciate you guys. Absolutely. So, Christine, did you want to pick up and, you know, talk to what is dear to a lot of our hearts is business? You know, a lot of us are on the entrepreneurial track and trying to open up small businesses if we don't already have them to supply that extra source of income. And it appears that several hurdles and obstacles have been set forth from the SBA, the Small Business Administration, uh, on people that have criminal records actually applying for some of their stimulus money. Can you speak to that a little bit and talk about those obstacles and uh, give us some insight? I can. Um, if it's okay, I know everybody wants to get to that. Maybe I'll just run through some other benefits fast and so we can get to that um, faster. Um, so for folks in federal prisons, they get free phones and video calls. Um, you get an extension of time to file your taxes until July 15th, 
but the longer it takes to file your taxes, it might be longer until you get the stimulus check. Um, your employer is allowed to contribute up to $5,200 tax-free for student loan repayment, um, and you wouldn't have to count that as income. Um, and health insurance, everyone, regardless of insurance, is entitled to COVID-19 testing. Of course, the testing isn't available yet, but when it is, regardless of insurance, everybody's entitled to get tested, um, and private insurers have to cover treatments and vaccines. Um, you can also withdraw from your 401k early without the normal 10% penalty. And if you donate um, to taxes this year during the pandemic, because the government is trying to encourage people to keep supporting nonprofits, you'll get a bigger um, write-off next year. So. Okay, small businesses. <laughs> I think that's what everybody <laughs> um, is asking about, so that's great. So um, there's a number of benefits for small businesses. Um, and there's like the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury to Death Loans, Express Loans, Emergency Grants, things like this. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program is the one that everyone's talking about in the news right now that ran out of money last week. And they're, ex they're hoping it'll get refunded um, as of 12 o'clock when it started. It hadn't been refunded yet. Um, but we're anticipating that it will probably get refunded with the same scheme. So I'll go through the rules of the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so all of these are for small businesses. The CARES Act does have some benefits for big businesses, but I wasn't, we're not, this is more for individuals and small businesses. Um, small businesses are generally companies with 500 or fewer employees, and nonprofits fall into that category as well. Okay, so the Payroll Protection Program, or the PPP, is the most popular loan because it's forgivable. If you use it for stated purposes, it can turn into a grant, and so that's why it's the most popular. Um, what you can do is um, you can get up to two and a half months of payroll um, as a loan, and then if you use it, Primarily for payroll purposes, it will be forgiven and it turns into a grant. So uh, you're allowed to use it for payroll costs. You can pay some other things like mortgage, um, interest, not principal, and rent. Um, and the, the purpose is they want to keep people employed. So as long as you're using it to support your payroll, then it will be forgiven. It doesn't count for um, folks making more than $100,000. So you need to maintain your staff for folks who make less than $100,000. You can't reduce staff and you can't reduce their hours. So as long as you keep people on the payroll and you're paying them the same amount, you will qualify for this if you're a small business. Okay, so you can also qualify if you are a sole proprietor, independent contractor, self-employed. Um, and this is the application at the Treasury. That's the link for the application. Okay, so if you have a conviction history, can you get this loan? Maybe. Okay. So um, businesses are, now normally it's a small business administration that oversees this. And normally they have very strict rules about folks with um, conviction histories. But for this loan, you're only ineligible if you're presently incarcerated, on probation, on parole, or subject to pending charges, right? Or within the last five years, you were on probation, parole, pled guilty. Okay. If, if, if that hasn't happened within the last five years or you're not presently on probation or parole, you can, you can qualify. If one of those things do apply, if you're on probation or parole or that happened within the past five years, you can still qualify if you don't own 20% or more of the business. So that would be one out of five. So say you have four business partners, there's you and four business partners, there's the five of you, and you each own an equal share. If you're the only one with conviction history and you own 20%, you wouldn't qualify. If there was a sixth business partner, then you would qualify, assuming they, also, they didn't have conviction histories. Christine, I had a quick question about that. You mentioned five years. Is it five years from the date of conviction or is it five years from the date that you actually got off parole or probation? 
because some of us have been on parole or probation, but our convictions are 20 or 30 years old. So how would that work in reference to the five-year clause? Um, it's within the last five years if on probation. So if you're, if, if the, um, in, if everything else was, you know, say 20 years ago, but then you got off of parole five and a half years ago, you would be eligible. Right. So even if my conviction was 20 years ago, but I just got off parole two years ago, I wouldn't be eligible based on the parole supervision. If you own more than 20% or more right. of the business, right? So if you have business partners who don't have conviction histories and they own, you know, 81% or more of the business, you can qualify. Can you tell us a little bit more about whether and how this applies to nonprofits who don't necessarily have a division of ownership in that same way? That's a really good question. Um, the language, the language says um, people who own 20% or more of the equity in the business, and that doesn't actually apply to, to nonprofits. So um, it's it's not it's not actually prohibited. If you say you had a, a board who were formerly incarcerated, um, there's no explicit prohib prohibition from that type of nonprofit applying for the small business loans. Okay. So there may be a small loophole there if uh, somebody who's formerly incarcerated or has been on probation or parole uh, is part of a nonprofit or is an is a, is a executive in a nonprofit. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. Are there questions out there in the in the chat? Or? Yeah, we, we open it up and if anyone has questions about the small business or the CARES Act in general, the stimulus uh, payments, unemployment benefits, feel free to ask. Uh, we're here to answer any questions that you may have on uh, how you can best receive your money or maximize your benefits. And if, if there's no questions yet, I can go through a little bit about the other um, benefits for small businesses. Um, in the, we have a LSPC uh, CARES Act manual. The manual has much more specific details on all of these uh, loans and the Paycheck Protection Program. It tells you what you can include when you calculate payroll costs, what you can't. Um, it's it lists what you're allowed to include, uh, what you're allowed to pay off with that money and what you're not, how you apply for, it gives you step-by-step -step how to apply for forgiveness. Um, and then just to go through the others quickly, um, there's the economic injury disaster loan. Um, you can get up to $2 million in loans, but they won't be forgiven. Um, and you can use this mostly to pay off other debt or payroll. Um, but if you use it for payroll, you can't get Payroll protection program. So. One question that somebody had, Christine, and you know this is an, an inevitable question: is do we help or can we help with the actual application process? Or, or at the very uh, refer, <laughs> um, refer people to a place where they can get help. Um, you know, if 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 they want to contact us, they can um, for the PPP. Um, there's not that much we can do. It's, a, it's actually, the application is actually a, just a two-page application. Um, it's, uh, the link is in here. Um, you will have to provide some documents, um, and then you have to go through the bank. So it's a little bit, um, part of the problem right now is it's the federal government that funds it. It's the Small Business Administration that manages it. But then you actually apply for the loan at your bank. And not all banks are connected to the Small Business Administration. So there are some, some problems there. Um, we can, our manual has more information. And if you want to contact us, um, and maybe we can walk you through parts of, the, parts of it. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, maybe you can put a link up there uh, to Christine or myself for people that are seeking help. And we'll, we'll do what we can in reference to referrals and links, et cetera. There's another question. Uh, that somebody had. Can you speak a little bit more, Christine, about how employers can help or are able to help with the student loans? Oh, sure. Um, there, um, if, if some some employers have programs where they they help you pay back your student loans, and so um, at this point, they're allowed. If they want to, they can implement a program where they can pay up to the five thousand two hundred fifty dollars um, for you for your student loans directly, and it will be counted as income. Normally, if they pay that, it's 
it's as though you're getting income and then you have to pay taxes on the next year. So, so for this year, they could give that almost as a gift. They could um, pay that off. Wow. Too. That's helpful because a lot of us are saddled with student loan debt. So that, that actually could be very helpful for us. Are there any other questions that we have out there before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, there's a question about if you're a 1099 independent contractor, can you get a forgivable loan for yourself? You should be able to get the forgivable loan for yourself. What they did was they um, they set these dates up where um, they gave first first the first bite of the apple to small businesses, and then the independent contractors had to wait. And by then, most of the money was gone. Um, but if it gets refunded, you, you can still apply, yes. Last call for questions. Christine, we'd really like to you know, thank you for spending time and putting this presentation together. We know that there are a lot of folks that have questions about uh, the CARES Act and the stimulus package, and sometimes it's wrapped in legalese and in, in, in uh, language that people don't necessarily understand or don't know how to access. So for you to be able to uh, sit during this time and put this together for all of us, I know you helped me uh, get a better understanding of the stimulus package. We're really grateful for that and look forward to hearing more uh, presentations from you uh, about uh, COVID-19, about uh, some of the legal ramifications, some of the economic ramifications. Uh, and yeah, just we were just really excited and happy to have had you and grateful uh, that you gave us that information. Well, thank you so much, Ken. And thank you everybody for, for logging on today. And I hope it helps. And feel free to um, follow up with uh, questions. My email will be in, in this and Ken's. And I'm happy to try to answer whatever I can to help you. We appreciate you. We want everybody to enjoy their Monday. Stay safe uh, and enjoy the rest of the week. And if you all have questions or have suggestions for future webinars uh, to provide you information about the state of affairs during COVID-19, feel free to contact us and we'll try to put a presentation together for you. Thank you. Thank you.